Welcome to a new test and teardown video. This time, something from the bio lab or medical lab. This one is a micro centrifuge 157MP from a Danish company called Ole Ditch Instrument Makers APS. This unit is from 1992. I think I saw that uh, on the rear label. So let's have a look at that in a second. There is a, uh, I think this is a compressor cooler down here. Look at that. So there's a big nasty fan and a compressor unit and all that kind of stuff down there. This whole unit is uh, 30.5 kilograms. And I still haven't figured out how to open the lid. See, there is a button to push. And then there is no effect at all. See, there is a like a click and locked like that. But the damn thing is not able to open. So, why is that? Maybe it has something to, to do with power. There's also a thing about this power switch. So there's a power switch on the front. And that one got no effect. I can't move it. I have been really, really mean and mad to that switch, and I cannot move it at all. So that's probably just left on, uh, on purpose. Oh yeah, here you go. So let's have a look at the back in a second. And that is the thing that rotates with all your different samples and, uh, Super cool thing. We got some important warning messages about oh, what to do and uh, stuff like that when you're transporting this unit. And what else can we see? We can see something about safety, safety checkup that was done in in 20. So, th I mean, it's only a few years ago this one was in service. And this one was found in a trash can. Yes, a dumpster dive thingy. So here is the real label. See? Oh, 1992. It is that old. That's quite interesting. Oh, what is that? Somebody left a funny note in there. So that's interesting. So power goes in and then out again. And then into the main unit so that's quite funny so that's definitely intentional i think we should just try and power it up and see if it takes the fuses yep let's do that okay, let's just try and power up this beast and see what happens and uh, this is mains applied and then let's crank this switch here on the back Nope. Oh, ho, ho, ho. No. No response. So. Hello. Nope. Not a single little bleepity bleep. So I need to see if I can open it. New experiment. Let's just take a power cord and go straight into the top um, connector and see if it blows up that way. Ooh, oi, 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 oi. So that power switch down there is the thing that is the problem. It is definitely on. Let me turn off that light and then Look at that! This thing is alive! Ha ha! Ah ha ha! Now I can open the lid! So that was some electrical thingy thingy. What if I just push start? 14 watts. It spins! Okay, let's just turn it off because I have no clue what the heck I'm doing. But definitely, it is spinning! So, I think the top unit is working, and that is the problem with the 
unit that is uh, something to do with that power switch. Hey, lucky, lucky. So that was super easy. I just took out two screws down here and then removed the side panel. And there's definitely a super compact compressor unit down here. It's really, really cute. And that main switch is not possible to move. So I think that is the problem. The fun thing is it's actually down at on, but something is broken inside that switch. And that is probably why this is entire unit was uh, thrown out. Just because of a broken power switch. Isn't that amazing? I don't think those are actually that cheap. Let me see. So this is the output power to the main unit and that goes straight up to that switch. And here is uh, mains input and that goes also to that switch, right? I don't know if we can see that. It has to be something with that. So yeah, I'm gonna go for that. We try to cut away all the cable, cable ties. So here's how it works. We got two wires coming in to the two top connectors and then the bottom connectors on each side, they're just one. So that is kind of how it is. Now we'll try and pull out all those and then mount a new switch and see if it's up and running. I didn't manage to find exactly the right switch. Uh, this one is the double width kind of type, but I found uh, one of the cheap, cheap, normal ones. And let's hope this is uh, able to handle the, the power. And let's uh, test if uh, the compressor thing here is uh, working. I think this is the relay that handles the on-off control of the compressor. That is more or less how it works. And then here is a little control signal for the relay. That's kind of all there is to it. Oh no, and all bad, bad words. Look at that, kind of yellow puke. After I had this thing lying down on the side, look at that. Oh no, I got some leakage. What is that? Cooling fluid, nasty stuff. Damn it. This can't be good. So, but why isn't it? It's not leaking out on my table. It's, this can't be good. No, no, no. I need to open the lid to get access to those screws. This way I can lift up this cover. So, I mean, I need to power up real fast and then see what happens. Let's hope this switch now works. Ha ha. Yes, it does. Power failure. Okay, so it's uh, actually storing the last setting. I need to push this. Ooh, it is some. Oh, look at that! It's some greasy, nasty. But I will have to fix that. I think I was able to figure out how to disassemble this thing. I mean, look, everything is made of super thick and solid materials, and we got a lot of weight to this uh, unit and here in the corners I found four screws in here that I could take out and that is what holds the top to the to the base and to the cooler and uh, also what I found here is look at that 2016 so the compressor was replaced recently and that's actually quite interesting so that means Probably the whole compressor thing is nice and new and still works. So now I'll see if I'm able to uh, get up here. Look at that. This looks like copper or brass. And that is the motor. This one looks like it could use a replacement. I got news. I've been cleaning up and all this nasty stuff was in here. 
So we had some leaked samples from this the rotor part and you can of course unscrew this with a special key and then you can lift up the rotor and then you will see some really really fancy bits look at that and i actually found the explanation for that so this system computer here is actually able to measure the type of rotor that is mounted that is what this is doing this is not for measuring the speed of uh, the rotations that is done by another sensor but this is data to measure the type of rotor because you can mount many different types of rotors for all sorts of different samples so this is a 20 um, 20 sample rotor uh, with uh, the t uh, 10 11 millimeters diameter they're kind of small for this uh, rotor and then around here I don't know if you can see this but then there was a little rubber gasket this one was mounted like that and it's just barely touching and also this part here is just barely touching and this is for when you spill some stuff you're not gonna get it all over the place and this is also why this one goes up here so you can just unmount your rotor and then clean up your mess. Somebody forgot to do that when this one was archived to the bin. So this, there is a, um, of course there is a belt that connects the motor to the rotor here. And there is a five to one ratio. I don't know if you can see the motor like that right now you can see the motor in there so when i'm rotating this one you can see you see this one goes five times per motor revolution and this one can go 25,000 rpms that is very very fast and with this kind of speed at this diameter here that means you actually got 30,000 G's. And that is actually amazing. So when you're making a one gram of sample, whatever it is, then this one gram becomes 30 kilos. Think about that. That is a lot of pressure in that liquid. What else can we say about this? So this is the... This is, of course, the, the cooling system, and the compressor, and then the cooling goes up here. And then it's, it's uh, of course, uh, I guess, wound around in here like a cooling coil. So this entire area here can be nice and cold for some experiments. That is a temperature sensor. And let me show you the little optical sensor down here in that little hole. Here you go, that is one of them, and then the other one is here. Is it visible? Yes, that is the other one, right? So they shine at a 45 degree angle to the different color codes on the back of the rotor. Okay, so that, let me see if I can show you so this. So there's another little spill shield here that prevents spill to flow into the main computer PCB. And here is the two optical fibers and they go to a little transmitter and a little receiver here. And so the system here measures the pulse, pause, duration, ship, and then figure out exactly what is the type of uh, rotor. And then we got a main CPU is 8085 uh, microcontroller IO logic it even says that uh, the company f behind this board is called Magnatech and it's done in uh, 91 but the software is made in 89 
and what you see here is Kule, so that means cooling. And then we got the the RAM storage and the clock. And I actually found in the manual some very interesting features I would like to experiment with. So I'm definitely not going to pull out the battery backed up data. Here we got some timer. And uh, what else have we got? Yes, we got the motor power board. I don't think there is a lot to say about that. This is just a motor speed controller board. There is not a lot of cool... Th oh, I can't put in any kind of light in here. But there is not a lot of uh, cool stuff. You got some little coils, relays and uh, stuff like that. Main transformer power supply. See, there's also a little, tiny little transformer here and a little regulator and stuff like that. So that's kind of just what there is to all that. I really like the motor. That is a super, super high quality stuff. Look at the big, fat metal here. This looks expensive. And of course you can replace the coal, the contacts for that. And here's the big wheel on the motor. And there is a little cooling fan and then it goes into this tiny, tiny little wheel that spins the whole rotor and the bearing system. See, this is the temperature sensor I was talking about. And down here, if you see this little wheel, I don't know if I can make this sharp, that little wheel, and here's a little optical, can you see this little optical fork sensor? We got five, six holes in that disc, and that is what's measuring the rotation. So if I crank this around here, we can maybe see the holes. I don't know if I'm able to show this, but that is definitely how it works. See, and that is the the whole cooling units that's just outside of everything. Uh, and then this uh, this whole cooling unit is uh, mounted on the outside chassis. And it's not in any direct physical contact with anything that rotates. So that is all this the stuff that rotates is hanging on some uh, rubber to prevent everything from uh, vibrating. So I think I have done a lot of uh, cleanup. Uh, it was super, super nasty in here. I took everything apart and now I'm going to put it back again and see if I can get it up and running and hopefully run the, the not so hidden features. It's written in the manual, but it can read out the number of cycles uh, hours it was on, all sorts of uh, statistics uh, you can read out directly on the screen by holding down some buttons while, you, while you're turning on and doing stuff. Definitely I want to play with that. It's actually a little bit funny to read manuals. Normally I don't really read manuals, but in this case I kind of needed it to understand all the cool features of this uh, unit. And normally when this one is powered on, and it is of course not rotating, you can push the button and then re release uh, the lid. But it's also explaining how you can unscrew a screw here and then put in a little hex key like this and then click, itty click, and open the lid. So this is called the emergency lid opening feature. And here's how it works. So now we're inside the casing and see here's a solenoid and this solenoid is the see the release oh, that is annoying see now it's released when there's power on the solenoid and we got three of them this one over here is just mechanically connected via this so it's locking on the two outer, and this is the button, the manual release button. And here is the display, and then all the 
and the little switches and stuff here on the front. Really, really nice. Oh, we got two switches. Really? Why isn't one enough? It's because there's a double safety feature in this unit because it is very, very dangerous to open when the rotor is uh, yeah, spinning. So definitely you want two switches. <laughs> yeah, you can imagine the kind of energy you have stored when this one is rotating really, really fast. It is amazing amount of energy. So now this unit is completely assembled again and it's nice and clean. And I'm of course going to test that everything works. What happened here is I powered it up and then the fan goes. But it don't turn on. Maybe it's something to do with the switch here in the back. Okay, so that was the switch on the back. It's funny. The fan goes on and it is using 21 watts of idle. I was hoping I could figure out how to do the temperature like that. New temp. I think I'll have to experiment a little bit with this before I play completely idiot here. But it could be cool to see if the temperature is running and that means this is going to go nice and cold. So let me try and play. It was actually that easy. I just dialed in 10 Celsius, hit enter, and now the compressor was running for a few seconds and then it turned off. So why exactly is, is that actual, so actual temperature and this is, I think this is the set temperature, but why isn't it running? Program one. So I got, ah, time. Let's try again. New temp, see, I set the temp. And then program hmm how do I get this up and running I really want to see the compressor is running oh, I hate to say this but I need to read the manual hey okay look what happened I just set the set the g-force to 5000 and it actually accelerated all the way to 5,000. And then I heard a kapow in here. And as you see here, all this is smoke. So something exploded in here. And uh, that is not so good. Of course, I turned off the power. Let me see if I can, if I can open it. Look at that smoke. This can't be good. Oh yo 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 yo! Where's all this? So, ah, now it's moving again. So that was the rubber bearing down there. That was not so good. So I have to run without that one. Okay. So here was the problem. So this uh, rubber gasket here kind of flew in and got itself uh, stuck, and now it's full of little rubber burnt uh, particles so i mean this is just out and i'm gonna go clean up here and assemble it again this one rotates perfectly fine so i really hope that everything is uh, still okay now it is assembled again and let's see if it works so here's what i'm gonna do is um this is ketchup <laughs> so if i put ketchup here and i if i fill another one with water I think that maybe we got balance, right? Don't you think that's gonna be okay? So let's try and uh, perform a little test. So I think I put it for 10 minutes, only 
five G's. And then it's gonna spin. Ooh, rotor error. What are you now yelling about? Enter to continue. Click. Then what? But there's nothing wrong with the rotor. Now there's the rotor error. Oh no! But it was working! How disappointing! So here's the problem. When this uh, rubber gasket went in here and got stuck in here and kind of burned and melted, it removed the color code under this uh, rotor. So now the system can't read the rotor and that means I have a defect system. So I cannot carry on from here. That is so bad. I'm sorry to say that is the end of this uh, video. There's no more to say. There's no more to do because this uh, color code the I used to have under here that is uh, read by this uh, the optical fibers as I explained uh, earlier in the video and I also showed you guys the optical um, color uh, white uh, black kind of color coding here it's completely blown away by the smoke and the smell and all that kind of stuff that happened when this one got in here because this one was of course defective so yes uh, without that I'm not able to run it at all so the end of this uh, video I must say that it was driving me a little bit nuts about the missing code track on that rotor so in my video it turned out that I actually took a few seconds of this rotor code it was actually in my video so here's what I've done I printed out a little bit too big and a little bit too small as you can see here just those pieces of paper and then I cleaned up the area where the code is supposed to be so my idea is if I put those exactly the right place and then I try to kind of manually by hand copy the codes to that piece of metal here and if I got a one that is a little bit too big and a one that's a little bit too small I think it's easy to follow the code lines and this way copy the black and the white um, areas and get the code right I mean why wouldn't this work at least I will give it a try instead of having something that is not working so here's my first layer paint attempt where I'm using my two templates the inner and the outer and then I'm trying to uh, to make a little paint attempt in the middle here uh, I started with a very very thin layer so it's not covering completely maybe it will even work the way it is now I don't know how sharp and how accurate the bits really need to be it could be fun to try and see if this works the way it is now so here's my first test with my own little painted color code so let's uh, go to the G new G let's just set it to 1000 just to see if that is okay enter and then let's start so it's running oh rotor error damn it so it's still not reading my code so I need to paint it one more go so after all the failures with paint and I was really doing a good job with paint it turns out that the sensors 
they used to detect um, the different color codes here. Those sensors, they are the 950 nanometer type. So that means this wavelength is not reflected by the paint I'm using. It looks like it's black and it looks like it's white, but that is only to the visible light that I can see. But at this wavelength, 950, uh, I don't have any re uh, reflection from, uh, from the white. It's just as black as the black is. And that is, of course, why I don't get any signals. And that is why my new co um, uh, code wheel was not working. So what I did is, I was, of course, talking to one of my buddies last night. And then he took the pictures that, um, that I got, put them through Coal Draw. He actually deciphered the the way that this is uh, made. He figured out um, the way that this is designed is actually using tape. So tape in two different widths was used to make uh, the black lines. And that explains the funny angles at the sides. And he also uh, cleaned it up using... Uh, a digital uh, recovery um, techniques that could uh, like restore the exact uh, duration of the different pulses and then he made uh, the disc a new disc in exactly the right diameter so i printed this out and glued it on uh, to the bottom of my rotor and now my unit works and that is because paper is reflective white paper is reflective also to 950 nanometers and the black paints uh, laser printers are using <laughs> is actually very uh, much not reflecting also in the 950 nanometer range and that is definitely uh, why my unit now works as you see here what it is doing when you close the lid and then you can change the different programs. Now I've set it to 5,000 Gs. I can make it 6,000, enter. And then the temperature, I don't want to change the temperature, but if I want to, all I have to do is click temperature, new temperature 26, for example and also the time all those kinds of things and when i start what it's doing is when i when i hit start it's rotating at a slow speed a fixed speed and then reading the color code look at that and then it's accelerating and then you see the acceleration So now we'll go to 6,000. It is I mean, amazingly stable. And amazingly quiet. It's a little bit funny. I ask for 6,000 and then it goes to 60. Okay, it's going down a little bit. So that's probably the, the time constants for, for the regulator, regulation loop. And uh, the program is set for 10 minutes. Oh, it also says the, the diameter of the rotor and all that kind of stuff. It's, uh, of course, read those info from the, from the rotor. But well, let's just uh, stop and then it's breaking down. I also tried to run the program with a temperature setting that was less than uh, room temperature. And of course it starts the compressor. And of course I see uh, ice in here actually. So listen to what happens now when the rotor goes to a full stop. Then you should hear this lid lock solenoid. Exactly. Then I push here. 
and then we can open. So what I've done is I put in two samples. One sample is ketchup and one is just water, just for balance. I, I really don't know if that makes any sense, but to me it did make sense. So this is ketchup and see, I don't know if we can see this, but the top part here is actually like transparent water. Yeah, you can see that now. So I can, of course, divide ketchup into its uh, parts. That is really funny. So what should I try next? What kind of fun thing should I make experiments with? Hmm. Let's go in the kitchen and have a One look. One of my other buddies suggested honey. So I got some of this really thin honey. This kind of, see? So let's see if I'm able to uh, separate that. It's really difficult to get into this little test probe here, but I think I'm going to uh, crank up the speed to 10,000 and run the honey test for 10 minutes at 10,000. And then we're gonna see what happens. Oh, I don't know. I think it's super boring to play with honey. I mean, this is, I've been century. <laughs> I've been been playing around with this damn thing the whole day. Uh, uh, there's just no way I can get any result with honey. Isn't that just funny? So here's some uh, food creamer. So let's see if uh, I'm able to do anything with that. That was a little bit unexpected. So this is the food creamer. And we got three different things. I don't know if it's that is visible here on the on the video, but about up to here I get oops. So I did a respin. I had to do that because I kinda dropped it. But I wanted to show you. I don't know if it's possible. Damn it, it's it's just overdriven. Yeah, I think you can see the three different things here, actually. Some transparent and some super wide things, and then some other milky colored stuff at the bottom. And this is a uh, food creamer. It's actually a lot of fun to to play with this uh, with this product. Ooh, it is ice cold here. So yes, definitely the cooler works really, really well. I can play a lot with this uh, thing. But thank you very much for watching. I think I will definitely call this the end of the video. So, uh, bye bye.